Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, it doesn't get said enough, but high school was hard. And uh, if you're within the sound of my voice, then that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I am the host of this podcast where we uh, sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brains, not just about uh, current projects, but uh influences state of the industry and so very much more if you if you don't want to miss an episode and you'd like to subscribe to our podcast we'd really appreciate it if you did you can find us over at apple over at spotify and you can find every single episode we have archived over at youtube at our youtube channel and uh you know what there's social media too if you can follow us there that'd be great you can follow us either at in the seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, and probably most importantly, because uh, it's where it all began, please visit us over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all sorts of uh, new movie news, reviews, and anything else our hardworking team is getting up to, because they do work hard, and uh, much like me. And on today's episode, what we're going to do is work a little hard. Er, we're going to talk with the writer director behind the new uh, film Antarctica. It's uh, it's an indie uh, sort of coming of age uh, story from writer director Keith Beard, and and it's it's the uh, the tale of uh, two lifelong. Uh, female best friends in their last year of high schools as uh, sort of the pressures of the adult world start to bear down on them as they're navigating sort of the doldrum existence of uh, of small town USA it's it's funny it's sweet it uh, it breaks the boundary a little bit to sort of make us wonder what's really happening and what's not really happening and it's it's one of those films that does does enough variations on the theme to really keep us engaged throughout and it's uh it is worthwhile checking out and uh, i would recommend doing so on all major uh, video on demand platforms and things of that nature but we sat with keith and we talked about the movie and uh, a few other things and uh, it was a fun chat and hope you enjoy it well anyway obviously first off i just want to say congratulations on the film i, I absolutely loved it now i mean walk me through the origin of the story because it's it's one of those sort of coming of age films that's on one end, very universal, but also serious, but a little dry and a little sort of satirical and wry at the same time. There's a lot of elements going on in this one. Yeah. So, you know, it was really a long time in development. Like I started thinking about doing a movie about kind of smart teenage girls, like a little bit outsiders, funny Um, because those kind of characters just aren't in movies enough. And then I got sort of interested in the whole sort of female friendship thing, which I think, you know, I mean, when boys are teenagers, we have our very, very, you know, close knit group of friends, but women's young women's friendships seem really, really intimate and intense in a way that, that boys maybe are not. And so I thought about these characters and they sort of floated into my mind and they're sort of amalgams of people I knew I mean, that's why there's that kind of dedication at the end. And um, I kept meeting these these women, like uh, I, one of, you know, the characters are kind of based on this, this girl named Zoe Donahoe, who uh, is a friend's daughter who I got to know and my, uh, my niece and her best friend. So it all sort of, you know, was like bubbling up. And then one summer I broke my leg in 2014, I broke my leg and, uh, I was, you know, housebound, bedbound, basically, um, and very depressed. And in about six weeks, Antarctica came out. And I guess the the things that it's like, you know, so the theme was, you know, uh, uh, female relationships, young women being friends. And I guess all the sort of other things just sort of came out of my... Um, my individual sort of passions and ideas. I mean, the, the sort of socio-political stuff was was me, all the sort of dark humor and the surrealism. It's just like, what else do I have to say? It's like, 
what, what I'm going to create this world. What do I want to say about, you know, small town America in this scenario? So, um, and when I was done, you know, like kind of vomited it out. And when I was done, I looked at the script and I was like, well, what do I know about high school girls? You know? Um, so the first thing I did was I started sending the script out to anyone under the age of 30 who was female who I could find. <laughs> and, uh, they all really liked it. And they all like the lot of really passionate, um, feelings, uh, in favor of it. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I got something. Maybe I should try to get this made. Um, and it took forever, but you know, it's, it's movies and it's indie movies. So that stuff does take forever. Is that, have I answered your question properly? No, absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess that's why it's Antarctica because I mean, when I first saw the movie, I was like, why the title? But now hearing you explain it, just sort of that small town America, it's like these two are in the middle of Antarctica. So that's, that does kind of, it, it, it gives it a nice sort of, rhythmic ring to it just to be able to yeah. sort of give us it, an idea of how the house these small towns feel yeah i mean antarctica is a, a continent where basically nothing is almost nothing is alive so it felt like a good metaphor and i thought you know ignorantly that it would be the first movie to come up on your vod streaming uh thing on your roku but it doesn't work like that anymore so whoop. <laughs> i like where your head's at though Hey, you got to think of the business side. You know, people aren't going to, if your movie is called Zardoz, they're really going to have to want to see it. <laughs> uh, talk to me a little bit about just about finding Chloe and, and Kimmy and their pairing together because they were, they really played off each other super, superbly. Oh, well, well, thank you. So um, when the script started going around the agencies and stuff, uh, a lot of young women actors were really, really hot for the part. Uh, I met with people like Brianna Hildebrand uh, from uh, Deadpool and Trinkets, who's, who was just great. Um, but I felt like she wasn't quite there for the part. Very, very sweet young lady, though. And a lot of other people uh, met me and talked to me over the part. Everybody was really into it. Um, and there was something not quite right. And, and also, I couldn't pull the trigger on any of, of the cats until I found my Janet. And, you know, agencies, uh, talent agencies don't have heavy uh, young Asian women. Uh, they, they would literally be sending me skinny girls or white girls. And I was like, do you read the script? It's like the second paragraph of the script is like Janet, her best friend, also 17, Asian American and heavy. Uh, so like it's in the script, you know? Um, and so I went through, God, it was like a year of trying to find uh, Janet's. And I talked to people on Asian American theater groups and I was on the internet da, 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 da. and finally uh, 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 I saw this picture of Kimmy. It was on, on backstage and I emailed her and I was like, oh God, she looks amazing. Uh, please don't think I'm a creep. You know, it's like, this is not a porn movie. I'm not trying to get you into. And she responded and we wound up seeing about, I guess, six girls for that part. And uh, it was down to Kimmy and one other woman, but Kimmy was uh, just nailed it. She has never acted in movies before. Oh, wow. she's, done, she's done some theater stuff. Um, and then at that point, because there were all these women who wanted to be her best friend, Kat in the movie, I started doing chemistry reads. So like a very famous young woman flew out from LA to meet with Kimmy and there was no chemistry at all. And also this is, nobody cares, but uh, the very famous girl was wearing a Britney Spears t-shirt at her, at her sort of read through with Kimmy. And I was like, are you wearing that Britney Spears t-shirt ironically? And she goes, oh yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I like Britney Spears. <laughs> And I was like, and I don't believe in irony in any way. Um, so I was like, they didn't have a good vibe at all together. So when I finally met Chloe, who was really, really sweet and very quiet and very uh, and a very good actor and, and kind of understood the part very well, the first thing I did was I brought them together uh, and had them hang out in a room. And within 30 seconds, they were laughing. So uh, I was like, okay, well, this feels like friends. And I you know, took picture video of them and I sent them to other people. And I was like, do these girls look like friends? 
you know, and especially sending it to women. Because, you know, you look at people, like I'm sure you've seen those things on the web where it's like, are this, is this a married couple or are these strangers? It was like, it was like one of those things. Um, and they got along tremendously well. I mean, it's, they, they talk like, I mean, we, I mean, honestly, we all, the three stars, the two stars and I all talk all the time and they hang out and, and they're very good friends. So, I mean, that had to be real because, especially because they spent so much of the movie kind of apart. You, I mean, you have to, it has to be real. You know, the chemistry has to be there or else the movie is just going to be sort of a, an, an exercise. It's not going to be a movie, you know, so. Um, um, anyway, and also interesting, um, a bunch of, of girls wanted to be in the movie and their managers uh, made them pull out because of the, uh, the, the female reproductive health aspect of the movie. What? So, yeah, Hollywood is not as liberal as you'd like it to be, or as it pretends to be, let's just say. That, so. I don't know, but, uh, and I mean, it's, it's, it, I'm always kind of fascinated because, I mean, especially with indie filmmaking, you don't necessarily get time. I mean, how much of the job has to come down to casting? Because I, after, after you've done the initial casting, I imagine you just have to be able to trust in your actors to, to sort of understand the material the way you want them to. Yeah, and, and also the big thing with indie movies is just prep. Like, you know, you don't have a whole lot of options to make stuff up at the time. Uh, so you talk to them beforehand. Yeah, and you really do have to trust your actors. I mean, movies are about casting anyway. It's like, that's, that's the, and also that's the part that you, you, nobody's getting paid for. It's like casting, you can really take your time. Uh, and because when you're on set, it's like, you're just burning money. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And the the other actors um, all came in a little later. The interesting thing is uh, the woman, Clea Lewis, who plays Kat's mom is pretty funny in the movie. Uh, her whole thing was, she wanted to talk endlessly about tone. She's like, am I funny? Am I serious? How funny am I? And I was like, well, if you're too serious, people are gonna throw like, you know, tomatoes at the screen. So like, you know, you, in order to be likable, be a little wacky, be a little goofy, just to, and you'll be the, like the, 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 the main two girls are, are serious and the other people can be a little bit goofy because it's like a Alice in Wonderland. It's like surrealistic fable. So once we had those hours and hours of discussion with her, when she came on set, she just, boom, she was ready to go. I, I, we didn't have any time. I didn't have any time to direct her. And uh, she killed it. She did a really nice job. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Your 20 minutes are burning up. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, some of the storylines, and I mean, in particular, Kimmy's and uh, the boyfriend in the spacesuit, I love just sort of the suspension of disbelief in terms of is, he, is she tripping or is he actually there? And just sort of keeping that balance going how big of a factor was it for you to to sort of make this story sort of slip in and out of reality a little bit at times just to sort of keep the audience guessing because I mean I think that's something that kind of works through the like the entire arc of the movie where we see these kids who are sort of almost having this out-of-body experience because they have to live in the small town yeah so that all came about when my old roommate got put on Lexapro, which is a very common antidepressant. Mm. And I said, what's it like? And she said, well, it's like taking acid, but not as fun. And I thought, wow, really? <laughs> so that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And the thing about, you know, the sort of the theme about the overmedication of, of women was yeah. uh, young people, especially was there and with the stuff about the, the, the sort of guy from space, I just thought, well, who would react to someone like Janet who's kind of closed off and is kind of a misfit? And I thought, well, kind of someone who's like a hothouse flower, someone who's kind of a, you know, doesn't leave the house, is kind of homeschooled, is the boy in the bubble maybe. And it sort of just expanded from there. And also one of the things I like to do is like, I, I always like to think, well, what's the visual element for this movie? You know, what, what are the visual elements that make it not a play? And I thought, well, 
<clears throat> this merging of, of fantasy and reality uh, it can be something very, very visual. And also, you know, you, it's also kind of good for it to add some conflict for her because she doesn't know what's, you know, what's real and what's not. And uh, so you go into that whole world. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was, you know, it was a much more interesting path with the medication than her uh, like dying or committing suicide okay. or something. Well, you know, she doesn't quite know what's really going on. And, and you know, it, it's so, and, and once again, sort of brought from real life that my friend thought uh, her antidepressant was like taking acid. Um, and it's interesting, I, there, there is a backstory with, with Ryan, that character that I didn't really tell the actor until the movie was over. So, so I didn't want him to really give up the, give up the goods either in any way. And so, uh, yeah, and also it's funny, that was another chemistry read too where I had Kimmy and I had this room full of good looking guys all sort of, you know, play with her and dance with her and stuff. And uh, then I showed the, vi the video to a bunch of women and I was like, who's the one? And they are all like Bubba. So Bubba Weiler, who's, who's on Harry Potter, who was on Harry Potter and Broadway. Um, anyway, does that answer your question? No, it, no, it, it absolutely <laughs> does. And I mean, I love just how you bring up sort of the visual elements of the film. And, and this is something I always like to ask. Like, if you can think back, is there a movie or a moment in your life that you can sort of pinpoint as where the light bulb went off and be like, okay, I want to tell, I want to be a storyteller. I want to do, I want to tell stories in this way. Yeah, isn't it amazing? I think everybody does. Even like film fans, like rabid film fans just go, it's, it was this movie, it was this time. So yeah, I had a, a very serious asthma as a kid. And when I was two, um, I had to go to the hospital. And at that time in my hospital, you had to rent TVs. They weren't already there. Right. So my dad rented a TV and I don't believe I had ever watched TV before, uh, or I don't remember it. And they were showing uh, King Kong movies and Godzilla movies. And I got to watch the original King Kong, the 1933. And also I think Son of Kong and Mighty Joe Young. And then I got to see Godzilla. And it really blew my mind. Like I can remember those two or three days in the hospital very clearly. Um, and that kind of excited me. I didn't know, you know, it was like fantastic storytelling. It was like, like a picture book or something that had come to life. And uh, then I got interested in all kinds of other things related to movies. And, you know, uh, I got interested in special effects and, and acting and all this other stuff. And, and I guess being a filmmaker, you know, uh, came out of being a writer. And then, uh, you know, it's much easier to make your own scripts than, than just wait for somebody to read your script and have them, you know, have them make it. But uh, yeah, so that was the Watershed Room, a very, very young age. And then, then of course, I watched a lot of movies as a kid and then I saw Star Wars. And then I would go to see uh, art movies at my local university in my hometown. I would sneak in because I was obviously not a college student. Um, so yeah, then I saw like, you know, Werner Herzog movies and Fellini movies and stuff like that. So, and of course, like going to the drive-in as a kid, like there were still drive-ins in my hometown. So my brothers would take me to see, you know, Burt Reynolds movies where, you know, it's like, you know, girls in bikinis and cops, you know, and, and you, know, <laughs> you know, Gator and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so yeah, um, but definitely, I mean, I think the uh, movies have such a power, you know, and it, it, I think movies also connect with certain people in certain ways. Um, I think everybody uh, who's a film fan can talk about yeah, that 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 moment where they just got turned on. It's like, you know, music or something. You hear a song and it's just like, wow, well, what's this? So. And, you know, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, because there is such a sardonic honesty to Antarctica that I found so refreshing because films like this, they tend to try to follow a certain mold or try to sort of fit within certain guidelines but it almost feels like on this film you're you're purposely playing just out coloring just outside the lines wherever you can and that really is something that we don't see every day because there's obviously a very controlled purpose to it as you made the film yeah absolutely i mean 
the whole thing about movies is you really, the only movies that interest me are movies that have kind of a singular vision. And the only point of making an independent film is kind of being allowed to do stuff that other people, that big studio movies aren't allowed to do. And I think especially now movies are so pre-packaged and pre-made and it looks like the same five people are directing them all. Um, and you know, I'm a weirdo. It's like my whole thing is like, just let the imagination roll. Um, and also my, you know, my high school experience was very painful and weird and it's sort of a way to get distance from it. And, and, you know, uh, you know, it's like the, it's like therapy almost. Um, yeah, but you know, the kind of the normal thing kind of never interested me. And, uh, but also it's strange because I think Antarctica is very, I don't think Antarctica is that weird of a film, though everybody, since it came out last week, is like weird, surrealistic, weird. And I was like, you know, to me, like a weird movie is a movie that doesn't make sense. Or a, a weird movie is a movie where like, you know, uh, there, there, someone's just swinging a camera around for 40 minutes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the best thing you can do as, a, as an artist is not censor yourself and hope that it translates. And when I made it, when I wrote Antarctica, the script, uh, I absolutely did not censor myself. And I just sort of painted the, the world as I see it. And I guess it's, you know, every, everyone should have a different perspective on the world and uh, a different worldview. So it's just sort of the, uh, you know, the high school experience in America, you know, uh, swallowed and digested <laughs> um, by me. And also it's interesting that um, when we were filming, we were filming this sort of nice suburban uh, town in upstate New York. Uh, people were telling me that the same stuff had happened at their school like two years previous, which is amazing to me because, you know, I went to, I went to uh, high school, you know, shortly after Lincoln was assassinated. So, um, you know, it's amazing. I don't think chinks change. I mean, I think the technology in which, you know, bullying and slut shaming and, and bad teaching and all that stuff that we go through in high school has changed, but I don't think the intrinsic system has changed. No, but you so, know what? It, it's, it's weird because it's messy because it's honest and life is kind of messy. And that's <laughs> sort of the honest experience that needs to be put out there in stories, especially for, for younger people seeing stuff like this so they can, at least have something to relate to and know, but it be entertained by it at the same time. And I think that's exactly what this film does. And I just want to say thank you again for the time today, man. This was a lot of fun. Sure. Well, you know, high school doesn't end, uh, you know, with you and, and, and two hotties in a Camaro uh, or a, a Corvette driving off into the sunset. It's a continuous process and we're lucky to get any peace uh, and, and joy and, and, and satisfaction out of it. So uh, I, I would feel bad about misleading people to what, uh, to what, to what, to what being alive is, is about. You know, life is wonderful, but life is also uh, depressing and, and disappointing. So, you know, you gotta, gotta have all in there. Well, uh, you do, man. And thanks again for the time, man. It was a lot of fun. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, you have a, a great rest of your day. We'll talk soon. You too. Absolutely.